The Toten Pairs podcast is brought to you by Toten Pairs, the full service agency that designs and markets products, services, and experiences for women. You can find out more about us online at totenpairs.com or on social at Toten Pairs. You're listening to the Toten Pairs podcast, where every other week we're bringing together industry experts, scholars, and creatives to explore how the many lenses a woman wears shapes her perspective. Tune in every other week for an intersectional perspective. Unconscious bias is our natural brain's tendency. It's how we're wired um, and it's based on our survival mechanisms. So we're, by default, we take on kind of that gut reaction and, and we'll make decisions really quickly. I'm Amber Anderson, and on today's show, we're talking about combating unconscious biases in design with RGA's creative director, Jen Hazelwood. A father and his son are involved in a horrible car accident. The father dies at the scene, and the child is rushed to the hospital. He's taken into surgery. The surgeon walks up to his lifeless body and says, I can't operate on this boy. He is my son. Now stop for a moment. How can this be? Think about it. This story, which is called The Surgeon's Dilemma, is frequently used to demonstrate the way that unconscious bias works. In the story, the surgeon is the boy's mother. But in almost half of all cases in which the story is told, people struggle to get to that conclusion. Why? Because our brains have been trained otherwise. Assumptions that we make about people are based on the way that we view the world and is heavily influenced by the way we're raised, the people we're around, and what we have exposure to. It's been noted that 98% of our decision making actually happens without us even knowing it. And unconscious biases exist in all of us. This is why, as inventors and creators, we have to be extra careful to ensure that these misconceptions don't make their way into our work as well. On today's show, I'm sitting down with Jen Hazelwood, creative director of the award-winning agency RGA, to talk about combating biases in the products, services, and experiences that we design. So in your own words, tell me about yourself. What do you do? Yeah, so I'm a creative director, um, but really focused more on experience design. So my role is to look at how do we how do we create experiences for our customers? How do we create experiences for humans that really kind of make an impact in their lives and also make an impact in culture? So I work at RGA um, in London, um, and I'm kind of responsible for a lot of our product and service design work. I'm responsible for making sure that when we're designing products our teams are aligned in regards to the experience and the design of of what that product um, looks like and when you say experiences in design tell me a little bit more about what that entails is it because you go way beyond just the interface I think in one of your talks you were talking about the evolution of design and how now designers are having to think outside of things you can actually touch and into things that are part of an experience with the technology can you yeah, a bit more? exactly. So I think when we unpack um, problems for our clients, we start to look at well, what's the the service or the product we're looking at creating, um, and even does it exist today? So if we're working with a client, we might step back and say, actually, what are customers engaging with? Are they engaging with social? Are they engaging with voice? Are they engaging with um, web? Or are they engaging with a digital product in itself? Um, And we step back and we look at where are those touch points and then we look at creating um, connected um, products or services that fit into those touch points to enable their lives. So I've worked across different various product design pieces from from Google. I've worked with with Dyson um, and just a various range of um, products that actually kind of impact into people's lives. I've worked a lot in financial services, creating banking um, services and solutions uh, that they can use daily to, you know, look at their finances, look at how they're spending and and also optimizing um, for the future. So my role is really about how do we make sure that we're creating the right product or service? Um, How does that fit into a broader um, kind of day-to-day experience for them? But then also, how do we make sure that as technology evolves evolves and how technology starts to play a different part in people's lives through things like voice and AI, what are the things that we need to do to to create that? Are we moving away from traditional wireframes and UI design to maybe conversational experiences with uh, chatbots and and kind of decision trees, uh, et cetera? So, yeah, really like looking at design as a, a lens to solve a problem of, of creating services to impact people's lives. 
And in 2017, you wrote an article that you titled Combating Unconscious Bias in Design. And in it, you mentioned the fact that you looked around the room a lot of times and you were the only woman. And then as you began to rise in your career, you were for sure the only woman amongst a bunch of men um, in executive roles. Um, yeah. What sparked you to write that article? Uh, I think it was a few things. At the time, um, RJ, where we were at, we were, we were trying to look at how do we make sure that women have a voice at the table and how do we make sure that there's diversity in the teams we put together because we knew that actually it creates better results. Um, at the time, there was also an initiative called Woman Up that, we, that was being done, um, which was really about making sure that women were allowed a voice um, and actually allowed the right mentorship opportunities to kind of progress their career. And I started just to get interested in the topic and I started to kind of research it and understand it further. And it was like, actually, there were things that um, I was, I'd gone through or experienced that I didn't realize at the time. But when I stepped back, I realized it was because you know, I was slightly different. I was, I was a woman, I was in a conversation in a different way, or I was bringing a different point of view, um, which sometimes was um, at conflict to what the, the general group was kind of dealing with. But actually, it enabled me to step back and think about, well, actually, I'm dealing with bias all the time in regards to how we're coming up with an idea, or how we're leading our teams, or even how we're communicating with the clients. And I just thought it was a very interesting topic to start to get into and, and you know, also start to question, like, well, why am I the only person in the room and, and why aren't there more women um, or even even more diverse people as part of that conversation? It was very much a lot of the time um, white white males that were, were there. So, yeah, it was kind of multiple reasons, but it was really more my me being inquisitive and thinking, hang on, what what's – this is – a little bit different and, and why and, and what does that mean for what we're trying to create? Yeah, well, and, I mean, one of the things that you highlight in your article, which we'll point to in the show notes, is a statistic that we also have talked about in Totem Pairs. It's the 11% of creative directors are female, why 73% of consumer purchasing decisions are made by women. And you yeah. say specifically, you know, the majority of designs are being directed by people for people that don't yeah. look like them. I mean, that, that stat hasn't really changed um, since 2017, which is also <laughs> disappointing. And I think there's a lot more, uh, definitely there's a lot of work to be done to make sure that we are bringing in the right people at the right time. We have the right mentorship available. Um, and we're really enabling women to kind of get into um, the, the right conversations and the right spaces to then create for, for the consumers that uh, are more like them, um, assumedly. But yeah, it, it's complex, but I, I think there's still there's definitely a long way to go. Um, and for me, it's about education and just calling people out, or it's about helping them understand a different point of view, or it's actually showing research that makes them think, okay, this isn't just some kind of woman in the corner preaching. This is actually true, and and the results or the the stats speak for themselves. Um, and, and it starts to create more of an appetite for people to then respond and, and change a little bit their behavior um, of putting teams together or actually what they're designing for and, and starting to feel a bit more empathetic to the end consumer that they're, they're creating whatever that product or service is for. Yeah, well, and one of the ways that I think you did a really good job of this is just bringing out this conscious, unconscious states of our mind. Um, and so in your article, again, you say like 98% of our thinking is in our subconscious mind, meaning that we're not even thinking about what we're thinking. It's just something that our brain has been programmed to do. Yeah, right? exactly. And so um, spending some more energy on that, can you kind of explain, because you went pretty deep um, on what's going on within our subconscious mind and might, that, how that might be influencing our design um, when it comes to products, services, and marketing. So yeah. can you tell me a little bit more about what you found in that and raise some awareness yeah. part there? Yeah, exactly. So unconscious bias um, is our natural brain's tendency. It's how we're wired um, and it's based on our survival mechanisms. So we're, by default, we're where we take on kind of that gut reaction and, and we'll make decisions really quickly. There's also different types of bias that start to creep in. So when I'm talking to people as well, I start to think about, well, you know, if we look at three specific types of biases that start to creep into decisions we're making or teams that we're, we're building. And the first one is about confirmation bias. So this help, this actually makes us search out for information that confirms our existing beliefs. 
Um, so it actually makes us look for people um, that will actually confirm what we're saying, but also it makes us contradict information that's different to our beliefs. So if we become more aware of that as a, a natural behavior, we can then start to frame, you know, who we asking for points of view from, um, and are we discrediting people that actually might be having a good point of view or a, a, a good decision, but actually it's different, so that doesn't kind of work. There's also affinity bias, and this helps us actually, you know, by nature we favour people that are who look like us or sound like us or share a similar background, um, and actually we start to see faults in people that are different. So again, it's about how do we build up our kind of a circle of people around us and, and make sure that we're actually um, opening ourselves up to understanding um, what that can be. Um, and then there's also social comparison bias. So this is where we actually compare ourselves to others, um, in just being in our social circle. So we start to look at um, feeling better than other people or not. So, you know, there's a lot of science behind unconscious bias. And what what's probably the most important thing around unconscious bias is you need to be aware of it um, yourself and you need to be aware of your own um, biases. So there's a, a test you can take. It's called the Harvard, Harvard Implicit Personality Test. And essentially that takes you through a series of um, prompts on screen um, and it helps you understand how biased you are. And, you know, you, there's many different types you can take from gender to um, political affiliations and, and um, colour and, and things like that. But it's kind of surprising. And even when I took it, I was surprised at like, you know, my biases towards um, different things were not what I expected. So just having awareness of unconscious bias is kind of the first step. Um, and understanding that actually, you know, it's not your fault <laughs> to think in a certain way. It's just how you've been brought up and it's who you've been hanging around with and it's who you've learned from and who's inspired you. And it's basically what you know, and I think the, the best training you can have is just, you know, spend some time understanding it and understanding other people, um, because that's the only way you can really open your eyes to other ways of thinking and and essentially, you know, what that starts to do as it creeps into, um, you know, your work and, and, and what you're trying to create for for people as well. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think one of the differences for those of us that are in the tech space or the marketing space is that we are, you know, interacting with people on our day to day basis, but the things that we're creating tend to be for people that don't look like us or that are not associated exactly. in the same groups. And so, what I did find uh, wonderful about your perspective on unconscious bias was your ability to translate it into actually creating something. Right. You've got several different examples out there of where you've created chat box and you've created personalities that may not mimic that of yourself or your team, but being able to understand who the audience is and create things that mimic their needs and not your own, I think is a mm -hmm. skill set that um, you carry on. Uh, and so can you talk a little bit more about kind of some examples uh, where you've seen products that have been created that clearly didn't take into account, you know, their target audience? Um, I think Kodak is one of them that you've given you know before in your talks and, yeah. then, um, and tell me a little bit about that and then how that influences the way that you set up your team yeah exactly so I think that the key is really to you need to research you need to get your into the skin of who you're creating for and, and that's the only way it's about asking people talking to them um, and really understanding what that looks like and you know back in the 60s um, the Kodak example is, is back in the 60s um, Kodak was creating film um, and and basically, it, it, you know, it was it, it was kind of basic back then. It was it was based on the technology that was available, but the colors that came out of it wasn't as crystal clear as it is today. So as they were um, developing their film, they started to see that actually people of of color of of dark skin weren't actually able to appear in the in the film um, properly. So lots of people had photos in their albums of you know faces of if they had dark skin, faces kind of blurred or not visible or, or not um, seen properly. And and the reason for that is they used this model um, and the model was called Shirley. And essentially Shirley was a white um, female and they used her skin colour as the test for what that sample film should look like. But they didn't test it with anyone with, with coloured skin. Um, and it wasn't until actually uh, magazines, there was um, there were some furniture companies that were trying to, um, kind of market their products in magazines and because the, it had like a dark mahogany colour um, it wasn't until that went into 
to um, publication and it didn't really bring to life the the color and quality of the the wood that the company started to complain to Kodak and say look you need to fix the, the film because it's not co- our colors aren't coming up um, in the right way and it took a company or and many companies to kind of shift Kodak's mindset to go oh okay actually you know maybe we should look differently at, at who we're sampling our film on and, and what that's what's that going to look like so they evolved their process and they created a new Shirley model, which was, you know, had darker skin and they had variations from um, African-American people um, to Asian as well to make sure that they had the sample size as the correct sample that was representative of, of a whole multitude of people other than just this one um, white female person. So I think, again, it's like it took a long time for them to get there, but it was just based on their biases. They didn't think to actually look at a different type of model and I didn't think to test it in um, a varied um, situation of people and I think we've early days of AI had the same problem where voice wasn't really recognizing um, accents properly so you know when I first wrote the article in 2017 there were some speech like we had people in our office that had um, Spanish accents, for example, and, you know, some voice assistants couldn't pick up their accent and couldn't understand what it was. And it was based on, you know, not really testing properly a varied set of voices to get the right data set to make sure that it was was um, kind of working for everything, everyone. So it's really about making sure that, you know, when we're designing, when we're creating things, we're stepping back and looking at who is our audience, who's our sample, are we are we covering at least a representative from each of those areas as much as possible? Um, and that combined picture allows us to then create the right design target and the right sample to then make sure that we're testing and evolving um, on, on everyone. And, you know, obviously we've moved on a long way from, from you know, Kodak film, but I'm still seeing it um, all the time in in stories that we're telling through uh, media uh, as well as through, um, you know, voice is a great example and AI and technology is that's evolving uh, to this day. And you've worked with some pretty cool brands um, to be able to help them make sure that they're creating inclusive products and products that move beyond just uh, standard gender and race, et cetera, but to create one-on-one connections and experiences. So for example, I think you worked on a product for Nike where you were able to create a chat bot um, that could communicate with people and coach them through like their training or things like that. Can you talk a little bit more about how you've kind of taken all your learnings and are creating these really unique experiences for bigger brands to make sure that they're connecting with people at a really, really fundamental level, just one-on-one? Yeah, I think the main thing is, well, there's two things. Firstly is who's on your team? So what I find and, you know, we're, we're guilty of it. We put a team together of people that have worked together before and they've they've nailed a brief and it's amazing. And then you start a new project and, you know, by default you bring the same people on that team. But what you find and, and what I've found in in the past is that team is the same. They look the same, they act the same. Um, typically they're white males. Um, and actually when you start to break that dynamic apart a little bit and then you bring in a diverse mix of people, you actually have um, a, lo- a lot better range of ideas. And it sometimes it's not as smooth um, as working with a team that knows everyone and, and they've done this before. But actually if you get through that messy process of actually bringing different people in and having everyone understand a different point of view, the end result is is better because you are having a solution that fits more people. You're able to look at different kind of lenses and able to look at different ways of of bringing that to life. So I think understanding who's building and designing that product is first. And then the second part is it it is about really understanding the audience. So we do spend a lot of time um, at RGA looking at what's the insight that we have Um, for the product we're creating but actually and for the consumers we're creating it for but actually what's the pivotal insight what's the pivotal insight that's going to change culture or it's going to shift a conversation or actually going to move people um, in a different direction and and that's kind of important it's about not just taking every bit of information and and getting making it over complicated but it's kind of digging through and and bringing out something that kind of inspires a team and it inspires um in the end the consumer is going to um kind of take on that that product or service or idea or 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 marketing campaign or whatever it is that we're creating um to bring through so yeah i think it's really much it's it's really much about 
understanding who and, and why and what motivates the people they're going to use this in the end. Um, and then it's who's actually thinking about this idea and working with the client and, and making sure that it's delivered um, in the way that it should be. Jen, I appreciate you so much for joining us today on the Tone Pairs podcast. Your feedback has been invaluable. No, no problem. It's great. It's been great to be here. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I'm Amber Anderson. Thanks again for listening to the Tone Pairs podcast. I'll be back in a couple of weeks to bring you a fresh perspective on women. In the meantime, go ahead and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss an episode. And if you feel inclined to do so, we'd love to hear from you. Leave us a review or send us an email at hi at or catch us on social at Toten Pairs across the internet.